on Saturday, the remote I'm sorry, be Senator closed. McCarthy, given it's 2 p.m., we do have to move to questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On the 31st of October, LNP MP George Christensen posted a photo of Victorian Premier Dan Andrews on his Telegram account, inciting violent comments threatening Premier Andrews' life. These posts have been drawn to the attention of the Minister for Home Affairs, Karen Andrews, and have been referred to the AFP. What action has Mr Morrison taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Keneally uh, for the question. Um, I, uh, I note that, uh, that Senator Keneally indicated that the posts had been either drawn to the attention of or referred to the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, and uh, uh, this, I can say, is the first I am aware of the posts in question. Uh, so, in terms of any other uh, engagement uh, that government may have had, I will take that on notice, Senator. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. On the 26th of August, Mr Christensen posted a video of Catherine King MP, which incited threatening comments directed at Ms King. The post was drawn to the attention of the AFP. What action has Mr Morrison taken in response to this online activity from Mr Christensen? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Look, once again, I will take that on notice in terms of uh, uh, any further information that can be provided uh, beyond, uh, beyond what the Senator has referenced in, uh, in relation to whether uh, any agencies uh, or others are looking at uh, those matters. Again, I'm not aware in particular of the specific content of the posts that the Senator is referring to. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Given Mr Christensen has fomented anger and failed to moderate comments inciting violence on his own social media account, has the Prime Minister directed Mr Christensen to remove posts and comments inciting violence against the Premier of Victoria and any other public figure? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Um, well, uh, let me uh, be very clear in, uh, in stating in the chamber, as, uh, as I said on radio this morning and have said in a number of other places, and as the Prime Minister has said as well, uh, there is no place uh, for uh, violence uh, or remarks that incite uh, violence or create uh, or inflame um, unnecessary tensions in, uh, in ways that could provoke violence uh, in Australian political debate. Uh, I've taken on notice that the specific references to Mr Christensen's um, apparent posts or apparent content uh, on sites. As I said in response to those questions, I'm not aware uh, of the particular posts that Senator Keneally uh, refers to or the particular content she refers to. Um, uh, but if, uh, if there's information in terms of engagement uh, in relation to those matters uh, that, uh, that I can add and bring to the chamber, I'll do so. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government's national plan is securing our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and will deliver more economic opportunities for Australian families and businesses. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator McLaughlin very much for his question, uh, and I know his interest in seeing uh, Australian business, Australian families uh, continue to be able to enjoy the benefits uh, of the dividend of Australia's management of COVID-19. Management that has saved more than 30,000 lives across our country, management that has saved many thousands of businesses and many hundreds of thousands of jobs across our country. Uh, and pleasingly, the national plan that the Prime Minister took to National Cabinet, underpinned by scientific modelling, is charting the pathway that is enabling each of the states and territories uh, to open up, to take the progress forward that gives businesses the confidence to plan and to invest. And we're seeing that across the country, uh, Mr President. Uh, new unpublished payroll jobs data shows that in New South Wales, new hires have increased by some 25 per cent in the fortnight to the 24th of October. This data also shows that in Victoria, new hires are up by 15 per cent, and here in the ACT, they're up by 22 per cent. It shows very clearly, Mr President, that businesses are getting Order. back on with the business 
uh, of creating jobs and creating prosperity across our country. Uh, indeed, payroll data shows that small businesses across Australia have created more than 300,000 jobs for Australians in the period April 2020 to September 2021, while medium-sized businesses created another 300,000 jobs. That's 600,000 additional jobs right across our country. For small businesses alone, it's showing around 18,000 jobs per month or around 4,500 jobs per week uh, being created. And job ads showing at a 30 per cent higher level than they were at the start of the pandemic. In fact, job ads in Australia, Mr President, at a 12-year high, underpinned by high levels of business confidence, high levels of consumer confidence, all of it thanks to the fact that we are Minister, well on that path to reopening. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. What are the next steps in the government's plan to reopen our international borders and why is it critical to supporting jobs and economic growth? Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, as the Prime Minister said today, we're making significant progress on the delivery of the national reopening plan underpinned by uh, that safe, sound scientific advice uh, that the Prime Minister has relied upon and has taken through National Cabinet. Uh, it's another win for Australians that we're seeing uh, today, uh, with the nation in excess of 85 per cent double-dose vaccination around the country, uh, that we can move uh, to enable from the 1st of December this year fully vaccinated eligible visa holders to be able to come to Australia without needing to apply for a travel exemption. This includes skilled and student cohorts, as well as humanitarian, working holiday maker and provisional visa holders. The closure of Australia's borders was one of the most important decisions taken to keep our nation safe. But this reopening, including reopening to fully vaccinated citizens from Japan and the Republic of Korea, uh, shows that we are now back on the path to welcoming visitors back to our country and making steady progress on the implementation Minister, of that national plan. Your time plan. has expired. Senator McLaughlin, a second supplementary question. How has the government's plan for lower taxes supported Australian jobs and businesses throughout the pandemic, and why is it important to continue this approach to ensure confidence through the COVID recovery? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, indeed, the government's economic policies have provided not only a safety valve but an underpinning to the economy and to Australian businesses and Australian jobs throughout the pandemic, but crucially they have also provided the platform for this strong recovery and rebound. In the September quarter just gone, $10.2 billion flowed into the pockets of Australians in tax cuts that had been delivered by our government, representing the largest quarterly tax cut in over two decades. We, suspect, we expect a further $15 billion in tax cuts will flow this financial year, around $1.5 billion every month going to the pockets of Australian families and households to be able to support their investment, their plans and, through that, our economic recovery. Small business benefiting from some $5 billion worth of lower taxes that we have delivered to them. All of that contrasted, though, if you saw the shadow treasurer yesterday, not able to give any commitments about Minister, taxes under a future Labor government, expired. whereas the proof Senator from us. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In August last year, Mr. Morrison declared that he expected the COVID-19 vaccine to be, and I quote, as mandatory as you can possibly make. Does Mr Morrison stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, the Prime Minister has been very clear uh, right throughout uh, the course of the pandemic uh, that we have no appetite uh, for mandatory vaccinations, aside from where the health advice makes it very clear uh, that and there is a real benefit in doing so. Now, in that regard, uh, where that health advice so led, uh, he led, the Prime Minister led and the government led, particularly when it came uh, to aged care uh, and uh, requiring uh, and asking the states to pursue mandatory vaccination around aged care workers. That was something the Prime Minister took to National Cabinet, asked the state and territories to agree with, uh, and they then progressively uh, set about uh, implementing that. We have supported them in relation to decisions about disability care workers and in relation to essential health workers working with those who are most vulnerable, most exposed when it comes 
to COVID-19. But we've been clear that, more broadly, the best way to achieve the high levels of vaccination rates that Australia has achieved, the more than 85 per cent double-dose vaccination across the country, is to ensure that Australians understand, first and foremost, the benefit of being vaccinated. The fact that it provides greater safety to them, their loved ones and those around them. And Australians have responded most positively and in world-leading terms in regard to receiving those vaccines. They have done so overwhelmingly voluntarily. We thank them for it. We acknowledge the fact they have heeded those messages and we continue through public communications campaigns and other efforts to pursue and to urge Australians who have not yet been vaccinated to add to that 85 per cent double dose rate to date. Minister, we... Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill. I think um, Senator Birmingham for his... Um, Senator O'Neill, why are you his on comments, your but, feet? Yes. But the point of order is relevance. Um, so I thank the senator for his comments. The question was senator about O'Neill, the minister was mandatory. being directly relevant. I the mean, question I'm happy was about to hear mandatory. Your point of order, if I please go ahead. So, Mr. President, the point is a, is a point of relevance. The minister has been talking about vaccinations and applauding Australians. I'm always going to acknowledge that. But the question was about mandatory, as mandatory as you possibly can make it. And I don't believe that the minister, with respect has answered that part of the question at all. With respect, I listened carefully to the minister's answer. I believe he was being directly relevant, Minister. Thanks, Mr President. As I said right at the outset, the government's always been clear and we have no desire for mandatory vaccinations except uh, where it is absolutely essential in relation to the health advice. But minister, we urge every single time, Australian to time get vaccinated. Your answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Mr Morrison then went on to say, and I quote, there are always exemptions for any vaccine on medical grounds, but that should be the only basis. Does Mr Morrison stand by this statement? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And well, Mr President, the answer is precisely as I said before, uh, that as a government, from the Prime Minister down, uh, we've been consistent in regards to not expecting COVID-19 vaccination to be mandatory across the country, but to supporting and encouraging every single Australian to get vaccinated and to supporting and to leading the states and territories in relation to vaccine mandates where the health advice has argued it is necessary for the protection of our most vulnerable. Senator Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Direct relevance, Mr President. Uh, th this does go to a specific question about a past statement from the Prime Minister and whether or not he still stands by that statement. Now, nothing the Minister has said actually goes to that statement. In fact, it's the new line, not the line that he's been asked about. Uh, I'm happy to rule. I've been listening very carefully to the answer. I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, the Prime Minister has said on countless occasions when asked about vaccinations that he was not going to mandate it uh, across Australia. Uh, he was very clear on that, very clear on that on many, many occasions over a very, very long Senator period Watt. of time. That's the position he has continued to hold uh, and that the government continues Minister, to hold, Minister, except in those exceptional your time circumstances. has expired. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. When asked if he's going to have campaigns from the anti-vaxxers, Mr Morrison boasted, and I quote, I was the minister that established no jab, no play. So my view on this is pretty clear and not for turning. Does Mr Morrison hold the same clear views or was he lying when he said that? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the Prime Minister absolutely holds the same clear views in support of encouraging every single Australian to get vaccinated. And indeed, more than 91 per cent of Australians over the age of 16 have had a first dose, have heeded that message, have responded positively. And more than 85 per cent of Australians over the age of 16 have followed through and had that second dose to become fully vaccinated. 
ensuring that we are one of the Senator most highly protected countries in the world now. That in terms of vaccine uptake, Senator we are one of the most highly protected countries in the world. Well above the OECD average now, above countries like Israel or the UK, a nation that Order. has demonstrated that you Senator can have a pathway to vaccination overwhelmingly voluntarily applied, but that Australians will respond to the merit of those arguments which have been laid out to encourage them to do so. Minister, they have. We thank Minister, them and we continue to encourage them Minister, to do so. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout and how Australia's health outcomes compare to other countries? The Minister representing the Minister for, for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson, for your question. President, on both health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. Australians have been rolling up to get vaccinated, and I join everyone in the chamber, I think, in thanking them for doing that, for protecting themselves, protecting their loved ones, and for protecting the country. More than 91 per cent of the eligible population over 16 are now protected against COVID-19 with the first dose. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has had the second lowest number of COVID-19 cases per capita, the second lowest. The USA and the UK have had more than 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. For example, over 12% of people in the US and 11% of people in the UK have had COVID. By contrast, 0.4% of Australians have had COVID. We estimate, President, that our vaccine program has saved more than 30,000 lives. 30,000 lives. While Australia has been doing it tough, our economy remains resilient. Australia was the first advanced economy to have more, than, more people in work than prior to COVID. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May last year. After last year's recession, Australia's economy, the GDP, recovered to be larger than prior to the pandemic, ahead of any advanced major economy in the world, President. And now, thanks to our high vaccination rates, we can start to safely reopen our borders to the world and Aussies can get back to doing the things they love. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What is the Liberal and Nationals government doing to further protect Australians against COVID-19? Minister. Thank you, President. To provide even greater protection against COVID-19, Australians aged 18 and over who have received two doses of a vaccine at least six months ago are now eligible to have a booster shot. This follows advice from Australia's vaccine experts, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, and approval from Australia's medicines regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The booster program has commenced its rollout directly to people living in residential aged care and disability homes through in-reach programs, Mr President. This makes Australia one of the first countries in the world to commence a whole of population booster program. With over 151 million Pfizer, Novavax and Moderna vaccines already secured for supply into the future, Australia is well prepared to provide booster doses as approvals are provided by the medical experts. Senator Henderson, the final supplementary. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Minister, as our borders reopen and we welcome international visitors back to Australia as part of our economic recovery, which vaccines will be recognised in this country? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has recognised two additional COVID-19 vaccines for this purpose recently uh, for the purpose of establishing a traveller's vaccination status. This includes Covaxin, manufactured by Bharat Biotech India, and BBIBP Core V, manufactured by Sinopharm 
in China. Covaxin is recognised for traveller, travellers aged 12 and over and BBIBP Core V is recognised for those aged 18 to 60. President, this means that many citizens of China and India, as well as other countries where vaccines have been widely used, will be considered fully vaccinated on entry to Australia. And this is especially important as we welcome back international students to our shores. There are now eight COVID-19 vaccines that have been approved, all recognised by the TGA for entry into Australia, and work continues to acknowledge more. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Minister, in March 2019, the Christchurch mosque attacks were carried out by an Australian far-right extremist, killing 51 innocent Muslims. ASIO is now reporting that up to 50% of its domestic counterterrorism caseload relates to ideologically motivated violent extremism, which is off the back of a sharp rise in far-right extremism. The past weekend, we saw far-right extremists on the streets again, and some have issued death threats towards public figures. Known neo-Nazis and fascists are in attendance at rallies. Some protesters held anti-Semitic and offensive signs. Does the government admit that far-right extremists are spreading their hate, abuse, and threats? And will you and the Prime Minister today outright condemn far-right extremism. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question. Um, she uh, she uh, is right that, uh, that ASIO has, uh, has identified threats from ideologically motivated violent extremism, uh, particularly nationalist and racist violent extremism, is growing uh, and does present a serious threat to Australia's security, and that they've estimated that it comprises around 50 per cent of their priority onshore counterterrorism caseload. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, we uh, unequivocally condemn all such terrorist activity, all such uh, um, motivations that seek to promote any form of violence or threat uh, to, uh, to Australians uh, based upon such ideology. Mr President, Australia's terrorism laws, which our government has, uh, has worked in a bipartisan way, uh, I acknowledge, uh, to strengthen uh, target criminal activity, uh, not ideologies or communities' background, but they target the criminal activities, uh, but have also sought to empower uh, our agencies, in particular ASIO and the Australian Federal Police, to be better placed, uh, to be able uh, to respond uh, and to ensure uh, that where uh, such views manifest themselves into potential threats, uh, those agencies are as well placed as possible to be able to respond, disrupt, counter uh, and prevent those threats. Uh, I do acknowledge the bipartisanship uh, that we have had in relation to the passage of such legislation and such reforms because, Mr President, it has required bipartisanship uh, given the fact that there have often been efforts on the crossbench to weaken some of those legislative measures that we have sought to bring forward. We have backed those tougher uh, legislative reforms, Mr President, with additional funding, uh, additional funding uh, both in terms of measures in relation to social cohesion as well as support for our security agencies to be able to undertake that important work uh, of identification Minister, and disruption. The time for your answer has expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. It's pretty disgraceful that this government and the Prime Minister keep refusing to outright condemn far-right extremism. Minister, on 9 December last year, I asked you whether the government... Order. Minister, nine... Order. Mr. President, Minister, on 9 December last year, I asked you whether the government would respond to the Royal Commission into the Christchurch mosque attacks. You gave me the commitment that our government will examine the report thoroughly. Has the government examined the report, and what are you doing about it? Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And, uh, and as I said in my initial response, uh, I do provide uh, very clear condemnation uh, for extremist uh, ideologically motivated violence. Uh, that is, uh, is very clear in my comments, uh, and I do so for any and all forms of such. Uh, extremist, ideologically motivated 
um, uh, activities. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, we have not only made the type of legal reforms uh, that I indicated, uh, as well as the type of investments that I indicated in my response to the primary answer, but we have also led internationally uh, in terms of, uh, of seeking to tackle the sharing of such materials, such as the tragedy of the Christchurch attack uh, in online platforms, uh, the Prime Minister's work there and the passage of legislation through this place, but also seeking to ensure uh, that other nations take actions uh, to be able to prevent such, uh, such sharing of such uh, horrific content Minister, in the future Minister, is an important Minister, part of a holistic response. Your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, a second supplementary question. Minister, amid the rapid rise in far-right extremism, which threatens the safety of communities across the country, will the government now finally commit to funding a national anti-racism strategy? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Senator Faruqi, uh, our government did provide uh, $63 million um, in, uh, in the most recent budget uh, towards social cohesion uh, measures to help uh, to bring Australians together. Uh, that included some $37.3 million uh, in relation to measures that help to promote unifying Australian values, identity and social Order. cohesion, and countering malign information online. Uh, we do recognise that Order. such disinformation poses a very serious threat. $17.7 million was provided to enhance engagement with multicultural communities. Uh, and $7.9 million towards research initiatives to help the ongoing work in relation to, uh, to these areas. The Department of Home Affairs has had more than 13,900 engagements with key multicultural groups in supporting these efforts, uh, a 519 per cent increase Order. in terms of direct outreach in that regard uh, to make sure Order. that we are able to be able to respond as Minister. comprehensively Minister. as possible. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Order. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In August this year, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, a business under property law has the ability to say, no, you can't come in, and they can ask for that. That's a legitimate thing for them to do. It's got nothing to do with ideology. But last week, he claimed that at 80 per cent, unvaccinated people should be able to get a cup of coffee at a cafe in Brisbane. Why did Mr Morrison change his mind? I'm sorry, Senator Gallagher. I actually missed who you asked the question to because I was calling the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Prime Minister has continued uh, to be clear in, uh, in the other chamber and in comments in, uh, in recent days uh, that he believes that Australian businesses, as he said in that interview on the 25th of August uh, this year, Australian businesses uh, should and do have the right uh, under existing laws uh, to be able to make decisions in relation to the operation of their businesses themselves, uh, that it is a matter for those businesses in terms of how they, uh, how they uh, structure their arrangements in relation to uh, customers and those entering their businesses uh, and requirements around vaccination status. Uh, we've been clear all along it was not the government's intention uh, to change the laws in relation uh, to those arrangements to either uh, uh, motivate or encourage more businesses to apply such, uh, such uh, provisions, uh, nor uh, to do so in a way that would prevent Australian businesses from doing so. We, uh, we provided and published, uh, as the, uh, the Minister for Workplace Relations did uh, through her agencies, uh, the information to Australian businesses uh, that provided them uh, with the choice and the opportunity in terms of how they respond. That's what the Prime Minister said in the, uh, in the interview of the 25th of August that, uh, that Senator Gallagher referenced. That remains the case, and it's what, uh, what he has repeated, I believe, in the House during the course of question time today. Uh, but crucially, Mr President, uh, it is the fact that uh, the vast majority of Australians, more than 85 per cent double-dosed, have done so. And that number continues to keep growing each and every day uh, that ensures uh, we can and should have confidence uh, that we can move through as the nation is the stages of reopening under the national plan uh, taken by the Prime Minister to National Cabinet. Uh, that means uh, steps are taken uh, to reopen progressively uh, from particularly the 80 per cent double vaccination level. That's what we've continued to do, and another important step was taken today in announcing the reopening Minister, of our international borders to, uh, to visa category The holders. time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary yes, question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. 
Recently, Senator Pauline Hanson declared, and I quote, he has listened to me because that's why he's changed his tune with the whole lot. Is Senator Hanson right to say she changed Mr Morrison's mind? Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I think I just, uh, on the primary question, uh, uh, when it was put to me that there had been some change of position, uh, went through the fact that uh, the Prime Minister's position, the government's position, uh, was consistent and is consistent in relation to the fact that businesses uh, have that choice, and it's the choice of individual business owners. Uh, the Prime Minister listens to people right Order. around the country. Uh, listens to people right around the country, including uh, including those in this place. Uh, he doesn't always agree with the positions put. By others, uh, and indeed, uh, he was very clear, and I believe Senator Hanson uh, made it uh, made it public that he was very clear that the government would not be supporting the bill that she brought to the parliament uh, this morning. Uh, it was debated, it was voting on, voted on. Uh, the government did not support uh, that bill. Uh, that is what the prime minister said to Senator Hanson, what she has confirmed publicly that he had said to her, uh, and uh, that was the position the government applied uh, in this chamber this morning. Senator Gallagher, second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Has Mr Morrison changed his mind, or is he engaging in doublespeak in order to campaign to a small and extreme element of the Australian popu population? And when Mr Morrison tries to tell everyone what they want to hear, how can anyone believe a word he says? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, Mr Morrison has provided exceptional leadership throughout the pandemic, from the moment on the 1st of February last year when the decision was made to close our international borders and to start that process, a decision that perhaps more than anything else kept COVID out of this country and provided Order the time and capacity for Australia to save 30,000 plus lives and to be able to roll out a vaccine program that has now penetrated and reached far greater proportion of Australians than nearly any other country uh, on this planet. A huge accomplishment Order. to see that occur. The Prime Minister led in relation to questions of mandatory vaccination when it came to protecting our most vulnerable, those in the aged care sector. Order. But then the Prime Minister also led in terms of saying we need to be able to reopen. He took a scientifically endorsed plan to National Cabinet outlining a roadmap to get the states and territories to see that path to reopening and well as well. It's been leadership to keep Minister, Australians safe, to protect Minister, Australian jobs, but Minister, also to make sure we can successfully and Minister, safely reopen. Time for your answer has expired. Uh, Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The British Medical Journal has published an article revealing the company that conducted part of the phase three trials of Pfizer's community COVID vaccine, covering 25,000 people, falsified data, unblinded patients, employed inadequately trained staff, and was slow to follow up on adverse events. Minister, the Morrison-Joyce government failed to conduct an Australian trial of the Pfizer vaccine and instead simply took Pfizer's word for it. Was this a failure in your duty of care to the Australian people? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator, uh, I can't agree with the statement that you make as a question, <laughs> Senator Roberts, at all through you, through you President. Uh, the Australian government took, undertook a comprehensive assessment of each and every vaccine that is being used in this country to ensure Australians had the confidence that we had a safe and efficacious vaccine for utilisation in the pandemic. Uh, and, Mr President, I think the results speak for themselves. If you look at the circumstances in respect of what's occurred in aged care this year compared to last year, the impact is prevailed profound. Mr President, it is very clear that we took all steps to ensure that the vaccines that are being used in this country were safe and that they worked. Uh, we, we took evidence and advice, yes, from the companies. We received the data that they used in their trials appropriately. But we also had the advantage of being able to use data from other jurisdictions around the world. And we've remained in close contact with those agencies 
that consider vaccines to ensure that they are safe to use, Mr. President. Can I say to all Australians who are still contemplating whether or not they should get a vaccine, please be assured that our public health system and our authorities, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, recognised as one of the best in the world, has done the, the, the yes, Senator Reynolds, amazing work to ensure that we have access, Australians have access, anyone living in this country who wants a vaccine has access to a safe and efficacious vaccine. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Prior to the TGA's approval of community vaccine, Steve Anderson, the director of the US Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, released data detailing potential community adverse outcomes, including Guillain-Barre syndrome, acute myocarditis, autoimmune disease, and death. This is exactly what's happened. In approving Pfizer's community injections, did the TGA fail in its duty of care to the Australian people? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. No, it did not. I couldn't be any firmer than that. And as I indicated in my answer to the primary question, the T Therapeutic Goods Administration has considered all data in relation to the vaccine, and in fact it continues to monitor the data in relation to the vaccines. Uh, we've, we've been extremely open with respect to that. We've published uh, reporting on the outcomes of the vaccination program here in Australia. We've published data in relation to adverse reactions. Uh, to the vaccines of all types, Mr. President. So I reject any assertion that the TGA has failed in its duty at all. No, it has not. I could not be any firmer, President. Uh, we have one of the best, and we should be proud of the fact that we have one of the best um, therapeutic goods as assessment uh, Minister, organisations in Minister, the world, uh, and we have safe vaccines for expired. Australians. Senator Roberts, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Latest data from America's CDC indicates that children aged 12 to 17 are likely to experience myocarditis and related conditions at the rate of 9.5 cases per million vaccinations. Yet after the second vaccination, that rate rises sevenfold from 9.5 to 66.7. In approving two doses of Pfizer community for our children without testing, other Minister for Health, Greg Hunt and Professor Skerritt at the TGA, risking our children's lives, health and future. Minister. The very simple answer to that question, President, is no. Uh, as I've said in my previous answer, uh, the TGA continues to monitor all of the data, not just from Australia, but from around the world in relation to the uh, impact and the utilisation of the vaccines, particularly those that we have uh, to be administered here in Australia. We continue to monitor uh, all of the data so that we have the most up-to-date up information and that we can continue to assure Australians that the vaccines that they are taking are both safe and efficacious. And all of the data and the advice continues to demonstrate that, Mr President. Are there uh, contraindications in relation to the vaccines? Yes, they are. We publish the data so that we're open with that. But we need to make ensure that Australians have confidence Minister, that the vaccines Minister, we have access to are the time, safe and the efficacious. The answer has expired. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government funding for skills and training is securing our economic recovery from COVID uh, by helping Australians to take up a trade, reskill or pick up new skills? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Macdonald for the question. And Mr President, in the last two years, the Morrison government has made an unprecedented investment in skills and training. And we've done this in particular to secure the pipeline of skilled workers that Australia needs. In fact, the Morrison government has delivered the highest number of Australians 
in-trade apprentices on record. What we now have is new department program data, which demonstrates that Australian in-training trade apprentices reached 217,400 in July 2021. That, Mr President, is the highest number since records began in 1963. 217,400 in July 2021, the highest on record since they began actually collecting the data in 1963. And Mr President, evidencing the positive impacts of the investment being made by the Morrison government's record funding of skills and training is now the number of Australians undertaking skills and training. It has actually now surged with total in-training apprenticeships and traineeships for June 2021 at 347,266. And this is up from 268,435 in June 2020. And again, this is a direct result of the policies that the government has implemented, understanding we needed to make the investments to secure that necessary pipeline of skilled workers. And Mr President, what we've done is we have supported tradies across the board, whether it's tax cuts, whether it's through full expensing measures, uh, which has now seen order books for tools, machinery, etc., fill up across the country. We are supporting our skilled workforce, and the numbers that we now have Minister, are proof of that. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. With these strong numbers, how has the government continued to boost funding to vocational education and training to secure the pipeline of skilled workers? Minister. Thank you very much. And Mr President, we have now seen over $8.5 billion in vocational education and training investment. That is what the Morrison government has done since the commencement of the pandemic. In 2020-2021, we invested over $5.1 billion in skills and training. And what we did there was we helped Australian businesses retain their apprentices, and then if they could take that one step further and take on an additional apprentice. For this financial year, we've boosted that investment again with a record $6.4 billion in vocational education and training investment. This two years of investment, it also includes around $3.9 billion for the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Wage Subsidy. And that was in course in recognition of the fact that businesses did need assistance to take on an additional apprentice and we would provide them with the necessary support to do that. And of course, we've now gone Minister, further and expanded that program. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, a second supplementary. How will a skilled workforce support Australian jobs and businesses as part of our economic recovery and reopening from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Well, Mr President, the government understands that investing and upskilling our workforce is a win-win for all Australians. It is certainly a win for Australian workers, and we've seen that with the numbers uh, that are now actually undertaking a trade, undertaking an apprenticeship, etc. Uh, they have this great opportunity for career progression, but also as you progress through your career, of course, you have higher earning potential. It's also a win, though, as we know, for Australian businesses, because with the numbers that we are seeing, they now know they will have access to a skilled workforce, a skilled Australian workforce, in fact, to enable them to actually invest in their business, to grow their business um, and to create even further jobs for Australians. But it's also, as we know, it is a win for the Australian economy by ensuring that, with the numbers that we are seeing, we are more globally competitive. And in fact, the incredible number of apprentices in a trade now show that we've made the right decision as a government in backing Australian businesses to take on even more apprentices. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did, the, why did Mr Morrison, when posting video of his media conference to Facebook, delete, delete any criticism of the violent protesters in Melbourne and only include those sections in which he criticised vaccine mandates? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, um, 
I uh, am pretty confident that Mr Morrison doesn't sit there and post the video content himself. I'm not aware of the edited versions Order. or what content Order. Senator Wong in particular refers to from which post. Uh, I am certainly aware that Mr Morrison's clear condemnation uh, in relation to uh, violent activities, uh, extremist activities that provoke, promote uh, or provoke violence in any form uh, has been clear, resolute and repeated time and time again, despite the fact that those opposite uh, try to paint some picture otherwise. Uh, we have been very clear, very clear in relation uh, to uh, the condemnation uh, of uh, such violence. Uh, and as the Prime Minister has said from the very first day uh, when he became Prime Minister, uh, that his aspiration is to see uh, policies pursued that bring Australians together, uh, that Order. support the best, the best ability. Those opposite, those opposite want to provoke these debates, I know. Uh, they, uh, they, of course, uh, want to line up want to line up the different state Labor premiers to go out and, uh, and in their coordinated attacks, mount their attacks. Uh, obviously, they don't think their own leader is very good at making those attacks. They have to rely on others uh, to make uh, those attacks on the Prime Minister. Uh, but, uh, Mr President, this insinuation somehow uh, that the Prime Minister has not made those statements condemning, condemning violence uh, or the uh, or the attempt to provoke violence uh, is frankly false. The Prime Minister has been clear Order on that on time land. and time again. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. This morning on radio, this minister twice refused to condemn without qualification violent protesters and violent rhetoric. Will he now do so? Will he now condemn them without qualification? And if so, will the Prime Minister follow his lead? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, perhaps that goes to the tone of all the questions we've seen today, that, of course, you know, the ability of the Labor Party to want to take any type of comment out of context, right. any type of remark, and twist it so they choose. I was crystal clear in my condemnation on radio this morning. I know precisely what I said, even if I haven't had the time uh, that they pretend to have had to twist or contort or selectively edit Order the Prime Minister's statements and what they choose to go from. I know that I was crystal clear in my condemnation and that I made sure, and that I made sure Mr President, as I have in previous public remarks and iterations, uh, that I indeed uh, condemned those who have shown violent signs, those who have sought to promote uh, or provoke violence. Now, Mr President, those opposites seem to think that there should be no acknowledgement, no acknowledgement that there might be some Australians who are not undertaking such violent actions, but who do hold concerns. Well, we're not going to be deaf to Minister, all Australians. Minister, that is not Minister, the approach our government will take. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, a second supplementary question. Why are Mr Morrison and this minister pretending to have condemned the violent protesters, when instead Mr Morrison is engaging in doublespeak in order to campaign to a small and extreme element of the Australian population. Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, why, why does the Labor Party always seek to divide? Why does the Labor Party always seek to pursue, to pursue arguments based on selective quotes, contorting different statements that others have made? Why does this Labor Party uh, always seek to make sure they personalise the argument, as they do against Mr Morrison time and time and time again. Why is this Labor Party so grubby in all of their tactics that they deploy? I mean, last week it was revealed that they are paying, they are paying people to put content on TikTok personally attacking the Prime Minister. That's what this Labor Party is up to. They're using the Chinese-owned website TikTok to be able to go after the Prime Minister in the most personal way they can. Why, of course, are they doing all of this? Because Order. they're not willing to talk about their own policies. That's what was clear when Mr Chalmers yesterday refused to rule out tax hikes, refused to say where they might be spending any money, refused to detail Minister. their policies because they're Minister. just about a vicious personal smear Minister, campaign. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. 
Can the minister advise the Senate on the recent strengthening of Australia's ties with our ASEAN partners? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, and I thank Senator Fawcett for his question. The uh, Australian government has been very strong in our support of an Indo-Pacific region that is stable and secure and prosperous, and, we, and in which all states, large and small, are sovereign and resilient. And ASEAN is at the heart of this vision, and Australia's relationship with ASEAN is fundamental to promoting it. On the 27th of October, we took a significant step forward in that relationship as part of the first annual ASEAN Australia Summit, ASEAN leaders agreed to Australia's proposal to enhance relations to a comprehensive strategic partnership. This is a decision which reflects the strength of our ties as neighbours. Australia is ASEAN's first dialogue partner, and this is the first time that ASEAN's leaders had agreed to establish a comprehensive strategic partnership. And enhancing our relationship to a CSP positions that partnership for the future and to help us address complex and emerging regional challenges together. This is all about substance and deeper cooperation between ASEAN and Australia. During my recent visit to Southeast Asia, I also met again with ASEAN ambassadors and the ASEAN Secretary General in Jakarta and had productive discussions on the implementation of the CSP. To support that cooperation, Australia will invest over $150 million into our cooperation with ASEAN, including a new Australia for ASEAN Futures initiative, projects that address complex challenges, including health security, terrorism and, international and transnational crime, energy security, promoting the circular economy and healthy oceans. Also additional Australia for ASEAN scholarships to support those emerging leaders uh, engaging here in Australia, and an Australia for ASEAN Digital Transformation and Futures Skills Initiative that includes VET scholarships. These are measures which build on the $500 million investment in Southeast Asia's recovery that we announced last year in the context of COVID-19 and our very strong bilateral partnerships across the Indo-Pacific region. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Could you update the Senate on Australia's diplomatic engagement with Southeast Asia and how we're working with them to address shared challenges such as maintaining an open and secure Indo-Pacific region and particularly the crisis in Myanmar? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, and I thank Senator Fawcett uh, for his uh, important supplementary question. As I said, uh, earlier this month, I visited uh, a number of Southeast Asian countries, including Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam and, in, and Indonesia, to meet with counterparts to further advance our relationships, including our cooperation on the region's important COVID-19 recovery. The range of issues that we covered demonstrated uh, the depth and the breadth of these partnerships. They included the strategic environment, including the situation in Myanmar, cyber, counterterrorism, mental health, maritime security, uh, transitions to uh, low emissions technologies, our trade and investment relationships, and women, peace and security. This was an opportunity to deepen our practical cooperation with Malaysia, to welcome Cambodia's role as ASEAN Chair in 2022, to progress the Australia-Vietnam Enhanced Economic Engagement Strategy, and to reaffirm our strong links and commitment to a COVID vaccine partnership with Indonesia. Minister, you... Minister, your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, a second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Could you advise the Senate of Australia's continuing efforts to partner with our region uh, on the COVID-19 recovery? Thank you very much. Uh, I thank Senator Fawcett again for uh, his uh, supplementary question. Australia has made a commitment to share 60 million COVID-19 vaccines with our Indo-Pacific partners by the end of 2022. That includes 20 million vaccines for Indonesia and 7.8 million for Vietnam. We have also committed $300 million in vaccine support to Southeast Asia and a further $100 million to the Quad Vaccines Partnership. Already, we have shared more than 6.2 million doses with ASEAN countries. That includes 4.6 million doses to Indonesia and 1.5 million doses to Vietnam. We've also partnered with Indonesia to provide emergency COVID assistance, including oxygen-related and other medical supplies, support for Indonesia's health response and community resilience through our work with NGOs, with UN agencies, community organisations and provincial governments. We'll continue to partner with Southeast Asia as we stand together to strengthen our region's health security through the recovery and beyond. Thank you, Minister. Senator McAllister. 
Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In August, Mr Morrison said businesses had a legitimate right to refuse entry to people who refused to be vaccinated, stating, and I quote, the sheer fact of it is if you're not vaccinated, you represent a greater public health risk to yourself, to your family, to your community and to others about you. So it's only sensible that people will do sensible things to protect their public health. Last week, Mr Morrison declared unvaccinated people should be able to get a cup of coffee in Brisbane regardless of vaccination status. Why should people in Brisbane be able to get a coffee regardless of vaccination status but not people in Sydney? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I thank Senator for her question and, uh, and indeed acknowledge the interview that, uh, that she was referring to. I think it's important uh, that it's understood uh, if you go up the page in that transcript, in that interview, uh, that the Prime Minister was asked whether he had an appetite for mandatory vaccinations. And the answer he gave uh, in that interview was no. Uh, he did not have an appetite uh, for mandatory vaccinations. Now, of course, Mr. President, I qualify that with the statements I've already made in question time uh, that, uh, that the government uh, did indeed lead in relation to mandatory vaccinations uh, to protect those most at risk uh, from COVID-19, to protect uh, those uh, in aged care facilities, to protect those uh, where they are engaging with disability care workers, to protect those in our health systems generally who are at greatest risk and to, uh, to ensure that we supported mandatory activities in that regard. Uh, Mr President, uh, in relation to businesses, as I've already touched on in, the, in this question time, uh, the government has also been consistent uh, that the legal advice from the pre-existing legal arrangements is that Australian businesses, be they a coffee shop, be they any other business, uh, have the power and the choice themselves uh, to make rules and decisions about accessing their business, including to determine as to whether or not uh, vaccinated individuals uh, can only be the only ones to uh, access those visitors, those businesses as customers. Uh, they're the laws of the land that we have supported. Uh, we've not sought uh, to change them in ways to force businesses uh, to make greater mandates, nor have we sought to remove the choice from businesses in relation to their choice to make those decisions themselves, regardless of which state they are in. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, can the minister confirm whether Mr Morrison has ever required journalists attending his press conferences to be fully vaccinated? And is this a current requirement? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. Morrison has uh, has complied uh, at different times with uh, with health requirements uh, put in place or requested by authorities, uh, be they the recommendations of be they the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Australia, or when he has been in New South Wales, uh, restrictions in place at particular points in time in New South Wales, or restrictions put in place here when in, uh, when he's been in the ACT. Uh, oftentimes, those restrictions have had to be particularly targeted to deal with the Prime Minister returning from necessary overseas work uh, and in engaging in that necessary overseas work uh, for him to then meet requirements of quarantining and isolating upon return, uh, but also to be available to be able to handle um, the duties of the Office of Prime Minister, be they the way in which he's engaged in Cabinet or other deliberations or with the Australian media. Uh, where it's been a condition that health authorities have suggested uh, that, uh, that uh, vaccination status be a factor in relation to those isolation periods. Minister, the Prime Minister has Minister, complied with that. Minister, your time has expired. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary. Thanks, Mr President. Why does Mr Morrison want journalists attending his press conferences to be fully vaccinated, but thinks a barista in Queensland shouldn't have the same protections from COVID-19 that he demands for himself as Prime Minister? Minister. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, could you imagine? Could you imagine what those opposite would have said if the Prime Minister, whilst isolating at the lodge on return from international business, had been advised by ACT health authorities or the Chief Medical Officer that anyone Order. attending a press conference needed to be vaccinated? If the Prime Minister had said no, Minister. no, they're not going to be. If Minister. he had denied that health advice. Minister, please resume your seat. 
Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order is direct relevance. The question doesn't go to a hypothetical about the opposition. Opposition. It goes to the Prime Minister's hypocrisy, hypocrisy, and consistent falsehoods. Senator Wong, I'm listening closely to the minister's answer. Minister, you have the call. And Mr. President, I, I paint that scenario because those opposite would be the first to condemn if the Prime Minister was not following health advice and health recommendations at the time. What he has done, what our government has done, is listen to and act on the health advice of our Commonwealth health officials at every step of the way. And that has included, Mr. President, in relation to questions around mandates and vaccinations as they apply. We have been very clear in the sense that we have acted where the health officials have recommended to apply those mandates to those most vulnerable. But the National Plan also makes clear that we should go through the stages with these high levels of Minister, vaccination to reopen and to Minister, reopen thoroughly. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am uh, seeking the call uh, pursuant to Standing Order 74.5. Alpha, seeking an explanation from uh, the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why my question 3985 relating to the costs of National Cabinet have not been, uh, has not been answered within uh, the required time frame. Indeed, this question uh, has been on the notice paper since August. Oh, minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I understand that uh, that answers will be provided uh, as soon as uh, as soon as they can be made available. Uh, that uh, finalisation of those is uh, is um, uh, being undertaken, uh, and I hope that they can be brought to the chamber um, uh, and will be brought to the chamber as soon as that is possible. Uh, Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to uh, take note of the, mem of the uh, minister's answer to this question. Well, again, we find ourselves in a situation where uh, we, we're not getting answers back from the executive in response to questions, questions that are relevant to our uh, constituents. In this particular case, uh, what I was uh, seeking by, the, by, uh, by way of uh, question number uh, uh, 3985 was an answer from the Prime Minister as to how much money was spent by the Commonwealth defending uh, their erroneous claim that National Cabinet was in fact a committee of the Cabinet. I would have thought that would be a relatively simple answer to get, just to go and have a look inside the, the, uh, the, the uh, accounting system to find out how much the, uh, the Australian Government solicitor had been invoiced. But no, we still don't have an answer. In fact, there's a second part to the question that relates to a matter that was brought against the Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, over the censoring by uh, the former Attorney General Christian Porter uh, as to a, an Auditor General's report. That matter concluded more than 12 months ago. So I'm asking the government, can you please provide cost information in relation to, uh, in relation to the, uh, the a matter that settled more than a year ago. No answer. Uh, somewhat inexcusable. So it's with regret that I have to stand uh, and ask to take note uh, of the Prime Minister's failure to provide uh, the, the answer to these questions. Um, as senators will be aware, this, the matter uh, of National Cabinet involved a comprehensive defeat for the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, especially for its secretary, Mr Philip Gaitchens, and the head of the Cabinet Division, Ms Leonie McGregor, who were, act, uh, who were acting as the Prime Minister's agent in this matter. In his decision on 5 August 2021, Federal Court Justice White determined that under the Australian uh, law, National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. Uh, and the documents that I sought were not subject to any blanket exemption under the FOI Act. In his decision, Mr. White, no, sorry, Justice White, um, was absolutely scathing, absolutely scathing of Mr. Gaitchens and Ms. McGregor, finding that their evidence was wrong in fact and in argument. Among other things, he observed their evidence tended to be generalised and conclusionary in form. I'm quoting from from the judgment. 
In some respects, the evidence of each was inconsistent with documentary evidence and seemed to assume the truth of the matter to be decided by the true tribunal, i.e. whether or not National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet. And in some respects, both the respondents, Mr Gaitchens and Ms McGregor, expressed opinions about the effect of the disclosure of the minutes on a view of their uh, content which is not borne out by an examination of the documents. I do not accept all their evidence. His Honour's decision was widely applauded by eminent legal authorities for its comprehensiveness and its definitive reasoning. Yet in what is an absolute defiance of a judicial decision making, the Prime Minister has refused to accept the independent umpire's ruling. Rather than appeal Justice White's decision to the full federal court, the government instead introduced the COAG Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 with the object of, of, of imposing a blanket prohibition on the FOI release of any cabinet records. Now that bill we know is going nowhere fast. It's worth noting that some, but it's still worth noting some of the evidence that was presented to the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee inquiry that considered its provisions. This bill is quite without friends. Apart from the submission of the Prime Minister's own department, all submissions uh, opposed or were highly critical. That included submissions and evidence given by eminent legal and constitutional authorities. Professor Anne Twomey condemned the legislation in emphatic terms, accusing the government of trying to legislate things that simply were not true. She said, it's just a mess and it shows disrespect for the people, for the courts, everyone to go around asserting in legislation things that aren't true. It's frankly bizarre legislation. I mean, why would you assert something that's not true? Why would you say in legislation that a cat is a dog or vice versa? The Australian Human Rights uh, Commission President, em um, uh, Emeritus uh, Professor Ro um, Rosalind uh, Croucher, expressed concern that the bill will increase secrecy from 15, across 15 different acts with the changes to the FOI Act being of particular concern. Professor Croucher rightly told the committee, Australians should be able to seek information about the nature of the decisions made by their representatives. This is even more important in times of emergency. When governments are provided with extraordinary powers, then it uh, can affect the lives and rights of Australians in significant way, ways. Um, Professor Croucher warned that the proposed changes would involve a permanent change to confidentiality rules over public policy. And that, and I quote, it's important that emergency situations do not become a broad justification for unnecessary increases in executive power to the detriment of democracy. Mr Geoffrey Watson SC, a highly distinguished barrister who represented me in the AAT, bluntly warned that transparency would be crushed by this legislation. None of the uh, submissions uh, of these uh, distinguished authorities and uh, persons uh, gave favour to the bill that was introduced. Now, significantly, Mr Gaitchens declined to appear before the committee. The three officials uh, sent in his place, Ms Leone McGregor, First Assistant Secretary of Cabinet Division, uh, uh, Ms Lee Steele, First Assistant Secretary Intergovernmental Relations and Reform and Mr John Reid, First Assistant Secretary, Government Division, gave a performance utterly unworthy of a Commonwealth Department that sits at the very centre of Australian government. Institutional decline and politicisation of the top ranks of the public service were all too evident in their evasive and unsatisfactory evidence. And where are we today? Well, with the government's bill stalled in the Senate, the uh, uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet are still refusing to issue documents under FOI in defiance of Federal Court Justice White, uh, Richard White's decision. Now, in response to a further application that I made for, for access to, to documents, P a PMC officer in charge of National Cabinet Affairs, Acting Assistant uh, Secretary Angie McKenzie, has informed me that despite Justice White's ruling, the department remains of the view that, and I quote, National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act and therefore National 
Cabinet documents are exempt from disclosure under Section 34 of the FOI Act. Just so it's all very clear, the Prime Minister is absolutely assessed, uh, obsessed with secrecy. Justice White made it very, very clear in his, uh, in his ruling that the National Cabinet is not a committee of the Cabinet, that that cannot be taken to be the statutory meaning. And here we have a judge, a judge of the federal court, making it very clear that it doesn't fit within the statutory meaning. And yet we have an official, Miss Angie McKenzie, clearly uh, politicised, a member of the public service, clearly politicised, saying, sorry, Justice White's wrong. Justice White is not correct on a statutory interpretation. Let me tell you the way in which a Prime Minister can influence the statutory interpretation, uh, statutory interpretation. The only way they can do that is when they frame up a bill to bring to this parliament. And maybe during a second reading speech they can give some uh, measure of what the meaning might, might actually be in respect of uh, an expression in a bill. You can't get to the point where the where the FOI Act, which has been in place since 1982, um, uh, where, where a judgment is made that doesn't favour what the Prime Minister, Prime Minister thinks, and suddenly he just says, no, I'm, I'm going to make up my own statutory meanings, despite a justice of the federal court suggesting that that, was, that, that is clearly incorrect. That's what we've got happening here. That's what we've got uh, happening in, in, uh, in this place. They've introduced, in response to the AAT matter, and again, my question goes to how much money was spent trying to defend this. Utterly de defeated, but nonetheless, we're entitled to know what the cost was. No answer to that question. And it's important because now what's going to happen is the FOI that I've recently uh, made that I've got this bogus decision uh, come back from clearly incompetent public servants. And I don't stand up here and have a go at public servants uh, without considerable uh, uh, um, uh, thought before I do so. But I think it's fair when, when a public servant uh, seeks to suggest that they can overturn a judge's view on what a word means in the statutes. That's the point at which you say something's really broken on that side. And we look at all the things that have been happening with the Prime Minister, saying blind trusts are OK. We're not going to refer that to the House Committee of Privileges because it seems to be OK. I'm going to tell a story that is, uh, that is different to the, to, to the words of, uh, or, you know, to how a French Prime Minister uh, president might have heard those words comes out saying at the start of the submarine announcement that uh, this is not about non-performance, gets a bit of pressure on him from the, uh, the French president. He says, well, OK, you weren't doing your, uh, your job well enough. Changing his tune, almost thinking as though he's, he lives in this 20-minute uh, world where he, he can say what he likes and, and, and then all of the evidence disappears. But we've got a situation here with this particular matter where we've gone through a court process. We don't know what the, what the, what the updated costs are because I'm not getting answers from, uh, from uh, the Prime Minister into, into what is a reasonable question about cost. Um, we, we're going to see a situation, because I've gone back, I've now, I've now gone back to the Information Commissioner for the second time round and said, this is wrong, except this time I don't want it referred to the AIT. I want it referred to the federal court. And who knows, who knows who might get the docket list uh, for, for my case? It might end up being Justice White remaking his own decision and we'll see whether or not the Prime Minister ignores that. I mean, to suggest, to suggest that just because this matter was heard in the AAT that it doesn't have a, a binding force upon the government. Now, this matter was uh, shifted to the Information Commissioner 
The Information Commissioner made a determination that it ought to be handled by the AAT in the interest of, um, of uh, execution of the FOI Act, gets to the AAT, everyone recognised the significance of it. The AAT said this is a matter that does need to go to a deputy president. We want a judicial member to sit on this and hear this particular matter. The Commonwealth goes, goes from a position of, no, no, there's nothing to see here, to suddenly appointing a QC to look after the matter. So we have QCs, SCs, a judicial officer presiding to come to a determination, a very solid determination, that National Cabinet is not a uh, committee of cabinet. And the Prime Minister does not accept that. The Prime Minister does not accept that. How much was wasted? How much was wasted in that? You might, might as well have just ignored the whole FOI, FOI process and just refused to give me anything. You've put the taxpayers to great expense to hear what the independent umpire says and you say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, uh, listen to what, he, what Justice White said. That's where you're at. And yet you won't tell me how much that cost. That's the, that's the burden of the question that I've asked. I think the Australian public are entitled to know that, Senator Birmingham. You represent the Prime Minister in this chamber, so you need to scurry away and go and knock on his door and get the answer for me. There's another answer to another question that has not been ans uh, answered as well. Uh, also to do with National Cabinet. And tomorrow I'll be seeking an, an explanation as to why that one hasn't been answered. So you might want to think about going for a bit of a walk after, uh, after your uh, duty has finished here in the Chamber, Minister, so that uh, you can get these answers. The Australian public is entitled to know. We ask these questions expecting timely responses, and we're entitled to them. We don't, we don't ask these questions for ourselves, we ask them on behalf of our constituents. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any notices to take? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers provided to all questions asked by Labor Senators today. Um, Colleagues, as, um, as you saw in question time, uh, we did concentrate our questions on the role of the Prime Minister over the past week uh, in, and his changing positions, it seems, on um, the use of um, vaccine mandates, uh, the roles of the states in terms of the, opening, the national reopening plan and his uh, failure of leadership in denouncing and condemning some of the encroachment of violence into national political debates that we saw through some of the so-called freedom rally rallies in the past um, few months, but in most particularly in the last uh, two weeks or so, where they have es escalated dramatically. And I think last week was a new low for this government, and it is it's, uh, almost difficult to say that. We've got a government the last eight years racked with rorts, scandals, waste, mismanagement. But I think last week, when there was an opportunity for the Prime Minister to show leadership at a time, and there are moments in time when national political debates or national debates on policy are, are being um, discussed, for leaders to stand up and speak on behalf of the country and on, in the national interest. And what we saw last week, and I know those opposite would like to dress this up as something that it's not, but we all saw it. Uh, we saw the Prime Minister give a very short address on the matters of um, violence and protest. Didn't, he said he didn't like it and he didn't want to see it and it wasn't part of our, the way we conducted our, our debates. But then he went on to give a much, much longer presentation trying to emotionally connect with those elements who were threatening violence against, um, in this case, politicians, but in other cases it could be other individuals. 
And he went on to speak of their frustration, how he understood how they were feeling um, as a way of empathising and sympathising with how they were conducting um, themselves by nooses, by threats to kill. Uh, This is what we saw last week and I know those opposite would like to pretend it didn't happen but we all saw it because we listened to the Prime Minister and the message that got sent around the country from the Prime Minister into people's TVs, into their news streams, however they access it, was, yes, I don't like this, but I get how you're feeling. And there are moments when leaders have to stand up and unite the country. And I completely reject the assertion argued by the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, that this is a prime minister that tries to unite the country. This is absolutely untrue. At every juncture, we see this prime minister picking fights, whether it be state premiers, who he, ha- he loves to pick a fight with, um, Premier Andrews, his personal favourite, I think, is Premier Premier Palaszczuk in Queensland, who he likes to attack fairly regularly. I hope it's not because she's the only female Premier left, uh, but it, you, do, you, you are left to wonder. But this is a man that seeks to pick fights. He seeks to divide, he seeks to tap in, he te- seeks to play across the field. It suits him to do this. He has worked out. It is a calculated political strategy for him to enter the debate the way he did it last week. Don't for a minute think he was thinking on his feet. Absolutely not true. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was saying. And it's dangerous because while it might be good and in his political interest to do it now, what we know from some of these movements is that they are very hard to control. Once they are off and running and when you have a prime minister that says, you know what, guys, I get how you're feeling. I know you're frustrated. And all these mean governments that are trying to curtail your freedom, they need to get out of your lives. I get that. That isn't standing up as a prime minister should. That isn't acting in the national interest. That is stoking division. It is cozying up to violent extremists who want to divide the country. That's exactly what this Prime Minister is doing and we will call it out because it is wrong. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Uh, I rise to take note of the questions asked by Labor senators uh, during this question time. And it is instructive, instructive to notice that once again, uh, Labor and the opposition are so completely disconnected from the people of this nation, from the reality of what is happening, uh, particularly in regional parts of the country, uh, but also the cities. And to have this uh, incredulous uh, line of questioning about uh, what the Prime Minister's stance is uh, just seems to me to smack of, of somebody who has not been watching what's going on over the last 18 months. Uh, the Prime Minister had established a, a national cabinet to allow the premiers of the states of our federation, federated nations to come together and to provide the sort of leadership uh, and direction that this nation so sorely was crying out for at the beginning of this pandemic. And it was the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of this federal government that pulled together, that quickly came to the fore with uh, financial support through JobKeeper and JobSeeker, a range of incentives to allow people to feel confident that there would be food on the table, that they could pay the rent during this time of extraordinary uncertainty. And yet, it was the state governments that would each time walk away from the uh, national cabinet process, uh, having agreed amongst themselves what the next step would be, and then doing whatever it was that they darn well liked. And for that reason, the Prime Minister has been doing what Australians have been asking him to do, to stand up and call out the inconsistencies, the inconsistencies in the uh, requirements of the state uh, governments. I, I have a list here of the different uh, sorts of vaccine mandates across Australia. So this is not Europe. 
This is not a, 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 a continent divided by different governments and, and uh, organisations. This is our own nation, where to cross borders is so complicated that those of us who have staff to assist spend all their time updating uh, people in our uh, electorates and states about how it is just to simply see family and move around the country. And in Queensland, my state, in just a couple of weeks, that Labor government will ensure that there is businesses that close, that there is young people who won't be working, that there will be uh, Indigenous Australians who have been left behind by the extraordinary lack of support for the vaccination process in Queensland. I mean, do you, we all remember the Chief Health Officer saying that she wouldn't have anybody vaccinated with AstraZeneca uh, and the politics that was played in that state because uh, it, it, suited, it suited the Labor states to play politics with these vaccination measures. And so now we're in a situation where Labor has once again walked away from workers, walked away from Indigenous communities and left them vulnerable and exposed. We have ambulance ramping and hospital ramping in our state that sends my blood cold. Because when uh, COVID-19 comes into our state, as it will, as we know it has across the rest of the world, uh, we will be in a dev very difficult situation when we have hospitals that can't cope with the most basic of health requirements, at a time when uh, flu illnesses are down, when uh, illnesses that are spread uh, by transmission are reduced because of the restrictions that we have in place. And Queensland is incredibly vulnerable, thanks to the game playing and the politics that Labor continues with. So thank God, I say, to have a Prime Minister who's willing to stand up and support Australians, to call out some of the crazy restrictions and measures that state governments are putting in place, and to say to Australians, I hear you. I hear you. And when Premiers say, we will reward you for your good behaviour, I say, how dare they? How dare they talk about rewarding a Queensland businesses for the, the hard work they have had? Where is the, the uh, acknowledgement of the terrible impacts on small business, on mental health? So I say thank goodness for the Prime Minister standing thank up for you, Australians. Senator McDonald, your time has expired. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Well, I'm not really sure what to make of that contribution. It, it was um, completely mystifying to me. I mean, the um, Senator Macdonald uh, indicated she didn't understand why these questions were be being posed today in question time. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let her know why. Because they're important questions. They're extremely important in terms of what is happening in this country and what our Prime Minister is saying to Australians. It's important. As Senator Gallagher said in her contribution, you cannot let extremists get a foothold. You cannot allow them to think that they are being supported in any way in their extreme views. And that is what the Prime Minister attempted to do in his contribution. The, the government, to take a, um, a well-known phrase used by former Senator Doug Cameron, is, in, is a rabble, You're a complete rabble. Today, you had not one but five government senators crossing the floor to vote against the Prime Minister. Now, we know that Mr Morrison got a good talking to from Senator Hanson last week. And, you know, his position has become a little more vague since then. But we know in the past the Prime Minister has expressed a view in support of vaccine mandates being enforced on people 
by businesses and governments in order to undertake certain activities, including work. Indeed, he expressly stated on radio station 2GB in August of this year that businesses have a legitimate right to refuse entry to someone who had refused to get vaccinated. Of course, fast forward a few months and the Prime Minister is being now threatened by One Nation and his own backbenchers to change his view on vaccines or have his legislative agenda held hostage in this place. Whether it be Senator Antic or Rennick or indeed Senator Hanson or Roberts, or in, in fact the angry and violent protests with gall gallows on the streets of Melbourne. The Prime Minister has buckled and bent to extreme elements, seeking to undermine the nation's economic recovery. Because, make no mistake, that is exactly what will occur if we do not promote the inherent importance of opening up and staying open by way of a vaccinated population in a, a vaccinated economy, with enforceable rules to underwrite it. And yet, when asked to condemn violent behaviour, the Prime Minister has chosen to express sympathy with the sentiments of those participating in anti-vaccination demonstrations. Dog whistling, pure and simple, deliberate, all designed to cosy up with the far right as part of a cynical strategy that is all about saving his own bacon and not about what is in the interests of Australians. It's a Prime Minister prepared to enact the agenda of One Nation and Senator Hanson. Because without the likes of Senator Hanson, the Prime Minister's agenda, whatever it, it is, would increasingly be stuck in the mud. A Prime Minister prepared to do dub, grubby deals to get the to get their support, but not prepared to honour his own commitments to the electorate. This is the same Prime Minister who has repeatedly promised to bring forward a bill to, es to establish a national anti-corruption commission and has failed to do so. Now, here we are on the eve of an election, no bill to tackle corruption at a federal level, despite the very desperate need for such a body on full display for all to see from the myriad of scandals littering the, go the government's rap sheet. But given an opportunity, the Prime Minister Thank has failed Brown. to do Her so. Time has expired. Senator Small. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And it might come as a galloping shock to those who sit opposite and come here to say that somehow the Prime Minister's agenda is being held hostage in this chamber. But I guess the contrast couldn't be more stark from a team that has no agenda whatsoever. We've heard today claims that the Prime Minister has a vague position or a, a somehow an unclear position. And again, the contrast with the Leader of the Opposition, who likes to have an each-way bet on every issue before this parliament, couldn't be starker. But what we have is a government, led by a Prime Minister, committed to delivering for Australians, the same Australians that sent us here last election, to deliver for them and to keep government from intruding into their homes, into their lives and into their businesses uh, to the extent that those opposite would have us do. So the Commonwealth's position is abundantly clear, and it has been since before COVID-19 was even a thing. The Commonwealth's position is that vaccine, on the whole, should be voluntary and free, strongly encouraged and only mandatory in a high-risk setting. Mandatory vaccination of workers is appropriate and is proportionate for those workers in specified high-risk settings such as residential aged care or disability care because of the impact on the most vulnerable of Australians. And that's why, leading the charge, the federal government did take that initiative. Some states and territories, uh, particularly, it has to be remarked, those led by Labor premiers, have issued far-ranging public health orders which require COVID-19 vaccination for people working in many other workplaces and sectors and for, indeed, in some community settings. 
Now, whilst I totally support the Morrison government in standing up for vaccination to reduce the risk of serious ill health or even death in the advent of catching this disease, uh, it must be noted that ultimately it is the state premiers who have issued the public health orders that require mandatory vaccines in a wide-ranging setting. The implementation of those mandates uh, as they mandate, I guess, uh, a differential treatment of vaccination persons is entirely at the discretion of those particular states and territories who have done so. The reality is that most Australians uh, have supported the vaccine rollout, and we heard howls and hyperbole from those opposite over many months in here about the vaccine rollout. But now that Australia is leading the charge uh, with vaccine rates that are the envy of the world, with death rates that are the envy of the world, and an economy that is the envy of the world, somehow those opposite have decided to move on to another baselessly shameful scare campaign that seeks to undermine confidence in Australia's health management of this pandemic and our economic recovery as we move into a post-COVID world. So that a reality couldn't be clear, clearer. Australians have rolled up their arms like never before to get the COVID vaccine. The federal government itself has been very clear that those vaccines will be free, will be voluntary in most cases other than those specific high-risk settings, and it is indeed the states and territories who have taken it further with their mandates. Overwhelmingly, those mandates are most severe, most intrusive, and uh, uh, I guess most invasive in people's lives, where they are led by a Labor government and a Labor Premier. Those Labor senators sitting here opposite today have very, very little to say. But when it comes to the Prime Minister's remarks, grossly misrepresented by those same Labor senators here today, that he understood that Australians were sick of government getting up in their grill, inserting itself into their families, into their homes and into their businesses, I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan's uh, great expression that the nine most terrifying words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And I think that represents our great liberal faith in those Australians knowing what is best for them, living in their homes and working in their businesses, not sitting in buildings here in Canberra. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator O'Neill. Um, thank you. Uh, Deputy President, and I just love the tone of reasonableness that's being adopted by senators making a contribution on the other side, as if it's not chaos out there, as if they've done their job in a decent and orderly way, because that is absolutely not the case. We've got a Prime Minister who answers questions and said, I'm the minister that established no jab, no play, the man who talks tough, who's leading the nation, making sure we're going to get mandatory vaccine rollout. But then he changes his mind. And we have all these excuses that come trotting out every time one of the members of the opposition stand to speak. Now, I note the answers to the questions that were asked by Labor senators, and I think it reveals a complete lack of morals, failure to admit responsibility, and a complete abdication of any national leadership on a matter of great importance. The fact is that you are 20 times more likely to spread COVID if you're unvaccinated. For all the words that are spoken here today, if that's one message that gets through and helps people make a decision to protect themselves and their family, that's going to be a good thing that comes out of our debate at this point of time. At a time when the country is fighting a global pandemic, the Liberal and Nationals are at war with their own government and Minister, Prime Minister Morrison is facing a revolt from within. He's got people from his own government who've basically indicated that they plan to join up with Pauline. They're not standing with their colleagues. They're not standing with the Prime Minister. They're not following him because they've figured out that he's not worth following. They're chasing One Nation votes, though, that depend on their agenda to try and get themselves a few more votes at the next election. The actions of Senators Rennick and Antic, despite all their protestations and equivocations, give support to anti-vaxxers. 
and their views have support, that their views have support and that their views have merit. Now let me be very clear, vaccines do save lives. They reduce the risk of infection, they help prevent serious cases and death in most cases. And that is frankly just the overwhelming medical consensus, supported by the overwhelming majority of medical practitioners. And any attempt to portray it as a conspiracy or allow conspiracies to stand damages public confidence in the rollout and harms our efforts to control the virus and keep our community safe. It's a disgrace that those who sit in this chamber, who have the privilege of the confidence of the Australian people, would seek to politicise such a matter of life and death. The vaccine in Australia was a stroll out, not a rollout. And for the great state of New South Wales, if Mr Morrison had done his day job in July of 2020 and taken on the Pfizer uh, doses that he was offered, we would have been getting that vaccine in March in New South Wales and we would have even had a lockdown. Businesses that have collapsed would still be going. That's the kind of failure of leadership that is the hallmark of Mr Morrison. And right now, with regard to this matter of life and death, Senators Rennick and Antic are playing politics. Vaccine and sensible public health measures shouldn't be the new front for whatever culture wars people on the far right of politics want to start. As Senator Lambie pointed out earlier today in this chamber, there are plenty of requirements that Australians accept to enable them to work in a safe workplace. You need to be up to date with your vaccinations to be a medical practitioner. You need working with children's school to work in your local preschool and you need a forklift licence to, for, uh, to, to drive a forklift. These are measures that are made to ensure that workplaces and consumers are safe and that our vaccination rates are as high as possible. Words matter. Messaging matters. The Prime Minister is aware of marketing. But the words of those opposite and their failure of their colleagues to properly call out misinformation to, probably, to properly deal with the fear and vilification that's now a matter of public record, and only emboldens anti-vaxxer extremists and conspiracy theorists. And that makes us all poorer, and it makes our recovery from COVID, both physically and economically, much more subject to the vagaries of uncertainty. Violent protests in Melbourne, public violence displayed against effigies, Continuing ratcheting up of political tension is aided in part by members of the coalition who, by visiting and speaking at these rallies, give political status and currency to issues you, and Senator people who do not deserve that expired. status. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to be, take note of all answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of Senator Birmingham's answers to my question relating to far-right extremism. In March 2019, the Christchurch mosque attacks were carried out by an Australian far-right extremist, murdering 51 innocent Muslims. Since that day, which so many of us had feared terribly after years of rising far-right extremism, hatred and racism, this threat has only gotten worse. It constitutes an unimaginable and devastating risk to the safety of communities across this country. ASIO is now reporting that up to 50% of its, of its domestic counter-terrorism caseload relates to ideologically motivated violent extremism, which is off the back of a sharp rise in far-right extremism. This past week, we saw far-right extremists on the streets again, having embedded themselves in anti-lockdown and anti-vaccination organizing. Some have issued death threats towards public figures. No neo-Nazis and fascists were in attendance at rallies, spreading their hate. Some protesters held anti-Semitic, hateful, and offensive signs. There are photographs and chat histories that are all in the public domain, which draw a line directly from some of the most extreme, racist, far-right organizing circles in this country, right into the heart of these rallies. Make no mistake, extremist groups are using the burgeoning anti-vaccination rallies to recruit and to grow their racist causes. Anyone who denies this has not looked at the myriad of evidence available to confirm it. And yet the minister representing the prime minister today could not 
plainly and simply condemn far-right extremism. The Prime Minister himself can't plainly and simply condemn far-right extremism. We got the same of what we always get, condemning all forms of extremism. This might sound like an uncontroversial statement, but all it does is deflect from the serious, unique, and present threat that far-right extremism poses. And that is very dangerous. Far-right extremism reared its head in the most devastating way in recent years with the Christchurch mosque attacks in March 2019, which were committed by an Australian white supremacist. I asked the minister in question time on 9th December 2020 whether the government would respond to the Royal Commission into the Christchurch mosque attacks, which had been published the previous day. Minister Birmingham gave me a commitment when he said that our government will examine the report thoroughly, all 44 of its recommendations thoroughly, in the final response of the New Zealand government to the report thoroughly, and will engage with the New Zealand government on how it is implementing the recommendations of the report and consider any and all implications for the operation of our own counterterrorism policies and practices. When I asked for an update on this question, on 16th March, Minister Birmingham was unable to give me a direct answer, saying that the report was not a report to the Australian government, but it is valued input in terms of an additional source of information that will inform the continued investment and policy making our government makes in relation to these important issues. Today again, I asked Minister Birmingham directly whether the Prime Minister had read it and what the government had done we got what was basically a known answer. No detail about responding to the recommendations within the report, nothing about working with New Zealand and considering the implications for Australia. The brutal reality is that this government just does not care, and it won't give any semblance of caring until it is, again, too late. Someone else or a group of people are going to get really hurt or killed, and then they will talk for a few days about extreme right-wing violence. And then they will move on again and revert to the script of all forms of violence. It's about as predictable as it is utterly depressing. It is absolutely disgraceful, and you should be ashamed. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the eyes have it.